From the southern tip of Africa comes a voice of revival. A voice revealing God's truths and desires for our lives. A voice equipping saints with the practical application of God's Word. We've got to have a firm foundation and that's the Word of God. So have your Bibles, notepads and pens ready as we get into more practical application from God's Word. Now all that's required is for us to have an absolute trust in this Word. Let's join Alan Bagg for more wisdom for life. Good morning again, dear friend. Welcome back. My name is Pastor Alan Bagg and we are here together on the Wisdom for Life program. We are studying faith this week and we're having a look at how important it is and not only just what faith is or how to receive faith, but how to make sure that your faith works. What will stop it from working and how to get rid of that and make sure that it works every time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today as we get ready to study your word. I thank you for a spirit of revelation to come upon each and every person. That as we hear your word, it enables us to see what we should be doing. And thank you for teaching us, guiding us into the truth. We receive it by faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, we go to Hebrews chapter 11. This is our foundation scripture that we've been having a look this week. Hebrews chapter 11. And we see here in verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that He is, that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we see that faith is vitally important. People wonder why we spend so much time around the subject of faith. And the reason is because everything we do, whether it's prayer, whether it's preaching the Word of God, whether it's leading people to Jesus, getting people healed, getting people delivered, everything is done by this foundation of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then he sees, we, we, we studied here the last two days, two criteria here. Number one, we must believe that God is. Number two, believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So in other words, uh, we believe that in the middle of a situation, no matter what problem you're going through, God is right there, He's ready to deliver you and set you free. And then number two, believe that the reward is on its way, simply because the enemy dared to come against you. Hallelujah. That's good news. Now, I don't have time to study all that again. Uh, please, you can get a hold of the tapes of these messages. You can get back the, the two days yesterday and the day before and get all that information. So, uh, but let's get into the message today and have a look here. What stops faith from working? Now, we've already established over the last two days that fear will contaminate faith. The other thing that will stop faith is doubt and unbelief. Now, doubt and unbelief is rooted in fear. But let's just have a look at this example in Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. When they'd come to the multitudes, a man came to Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic. And he suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon that came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Notice, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So, obviously when he's talking here, he's speaking in faith. And, and then as long as you're pleasing God, nothing is impossible. Now, that's a big statement if you think about it. Nothing is impossible. Well, he said, yeah, if you would just have faith as a mustard seed. Now, get a hold of what happened here. First of all, the disciples tried to cast this demon out. Now, we know for a fact that they have the authority to do that. We see it in previous uh, chapters in Matthew where Jesus takes his disciples and he anoints them. Have a look here in Matthew chapter 10. When Jesus had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. So Jesus gives them power over these demonic spirits. So they've got the power. Back here, now later on, this is after he had given them the power, Matthew 17, they try and do it, 
and it didn't work. And so they come to Jesus and say, why could we not do it? Now notice when this man comes along and says, listen, your disciples couldn't cure him. Jesus doesn't turn around and say, oh, you know, don't worry, I'm here and these guys are just learning and uh, uh, bring him here. I'll do it for you just as well. I'm still here and I'll sort out any problem you got. He says, no, how long am I going to put up with you guys? I gave you power. I gave you the authority. I gave you the ability. Now you're still not doing it. So he, he immediately addresses the situation. And so they, they cried, you know, they, they say, but then why couldn't we do it? Notice he says, because of your unbelief. Now the verse 21 says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now if you've got a good Bible, you'll see it has a little mark there. And it says that this was not in the original script. So this yeah, it was not written by Matthew. The translator put this in. I don't know why it did it. Maybe he saw the cross-reference in Mark because Mark says it does not come out except by prayer. But if, uh, even the word fasting is not in the original in Mark. So I'm not sure why uh, the translator decided to put that there. But notice Jesus says the reason in verse 20 that they could not do it is because of their unbelief. In other words, their doubt. They had the power, they had the authority, they had the anointing. Jesus had put that on them. Now, they didn't have the anointing in them. We as born-again believers have the anointing in us, but also you have the anointing on. You can see that in the book of Acts where uh, the disciples got together in the upper room. Now, prior to that, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So they were born again. They had the Holy Spirit in them. But in the book of Acts, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them. So you have the Spirit in you and on you. Now, as a born-again believer, you have the Spirit in you, and you can also, when you need to move in the gifts and that, the anointing comes on you to carry that out. Now, in this situation, the disciples were not yet born again. So they could not have the Holy Spirit and His anointing in them. But Jesus did certainly put the anointing on them so that they could carry out these things. And he says, you have power over the enemy, but they didn't exercise it. And they said, yeah, because of your unbelief. He said, if you just have faith as a mustard seed. Now again, the mustard seed is an extremely small seed. It's one of the smallest seeds on the earth today. If he had said, you know, have faith as an avocado pup, or have faith as a mango seed. Well, then, you know, we could say, you know, I don't quite have that amount of faith. But he chose the smallest of seeds. And he said, if you just have faith as a mustard seed. See, that seed, if, if I had a mustard seed and I put it on my palm here and showed it to you there, from that distance, you would not even be able to see it. Maybe you just see a little black speck. It is so tiny. Yet you take that thing and you plant it, that becomes one of the biggest trees known to man. It, the, the mustard tree is a very big tree. But the power is involved in that tiny little seed. And Jesus says, that's all you need. You can tell this mountain to move from here to there, and it'll listen to you. Now think about that. That is an amazing statement. Now, <laughs> here we go now. Doubt and unbelief. Where must the belief take place? In the heart. You see, a lot of times, people believe things with their heads. You know, I can tell you the Word of God says, by Jesus' stripes you've been healed, and take you to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and show it to you, and you can say, Hmm, I see that. Now your eyes have seen it and you believe it because I said so and you've read it. And so there's a certain amount of belief that happens. But do you yet believe it in your heart? We have to get to a place where we believe it in our heart. Now the example I always like to use, let's say for example, Jesus said yeah, that you can tell a mountain to move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible. Let's say I look at this Bible here. Now, you take this Bible, and I said, now, Bible, I'm telling you to move from there to the end of the table. Now, a lot of people would uh, look at that and say, yeah, right, but let's say next moment the Bible lifted up off the air and went over and dropped onto the table. Now, of course, there will be a whole bunch of people who say, no, that's trick photography or whatever, but let's say I looked into your house and I said, that couch you're sitting on, let that couch lift up one foot off the ground, and next moment, whoop, it lifted up. Now, how do you know that is possible? That's what Jesus said Yeah, He says, nothing is impossible. You can tell the mountain to move from here to there. Let's say I told your couch, move from that side of the lounge to that side of the lounge. The next one, the couch moved. I tell you, most people go, wow, 
how you not get a Friday? What's happening? Now, that's because in our minds we thought, yeah, anything's, imp- anything's possible, nothing's impossible. Yes, amen, preach it, Pastor Alan, hallelujah. But the moment it happened, we, re- whoa, what happened? Yeah, well, that's because in our hearts we didn't quite expect it to happen. And so what I'm encouraging us with here is, is we need to develop our faith to a place where we're convinced in our heart of hearts. Now, of course, there's no reason for me to move the couch around or to make the Bible slide. But there are times when I need to be able to deal with the devil. I need to tell sickness. I need to tell a cancer. That cancer may have grown out. It may be a great big growth. I tell the thing, drop off that body in the name of Jesus. That thing must listen and immediately break off that body and drop. And, I, and I've heard of great miracles where that has happened. And so we have that authority and the ability to do that. But how, when is it going to happen in your and my life when we get to a place where we are absolutely convinced it can happen? How do we get there? Well, Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, you don't need 20 or 30 scriptures. He said, yeah, if you have faith as a mustard seed. So you don't need to go in and get a whole bunch of, now, obviously, to renew your mind to a truth of God's word, you need more than two or three scriptures. The Bible says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a truth be established. So I may need a number of scriptures in the Word to get to a place where I'm convinced that's the truth. But once I'm convinced it's the truth, to build faith, all I need is one seed. So you don't need a whole bunch of scriptures. If you believe in God for your healing, you can take 1 Peter 2.24. Or allow God to lead you to a specific scripture. And then you take that one verse, you say, Lord, I need a word that will give me a promise to get out of this problem. I receive it in the name of Jesus, and according to 1 Colossians chapter, uh, according to Colossians 1 verse 9 and 10, I believe that I am filled with the knowledge of your will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and my walk is worthy of you, fully pleasing you, and I am fruitful in every good work. And I increase in the knowledge of God. Now, Holy Spirit, you guide me to the Scripture. You just read and you allow Him to lead you. And eventually, He'll highlight a verse. Bam! There it goes. That word speaks rhema into your heart. Say, this is my promise. You take that Scripture and you confess it over and over and over. You just put that seed down. You speak it again. Put that seed down. Speak it again. Put that seed down. Speak it again. Put it, plant it in your heart. Plant it in your heart. Say it over and over and over. What you're doing is you're embedding that word in your heart in abundance. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So by saying that word again and again and again, you deliver it down deep in your heart, and eventually it'll rise up, and that seed will birth as the harvest. One day, all of a sudden, you'll say, By Jesus' stripes, I have been healed. Wham! This word will come alive inside of you. <laughs> Say, wow! I, yes, I've been healed. Yes, it's by Jesus' stripes. Yes, I believe it. Now when you speak, say, be healed in the name of Jesus. That thing goes into action and it moves. And it's mountain moving faith. Now, how, how did that happen? Because you believed. Now notice he says it's because of unbelief. So what should these disciples have done? They would have tried to cast the demon out. That thing may have said, forget it, I'm not going anywhere. They should have just regrouped, pulled back and said, hang on now. What did Jesus tell us back there in Matthew 10? He put his hands on us. And Peter, that means we can do this. Yes, Matthew, you're right. Well, let's go and do it. Well, all right. John, are you into this? Yes, I hear the word of God. And Jesus said that, that if we lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. I remember Jesus saying that. You know what, Peter? Jesus also said that we have power over the devil. That's right. We believe Jesus' words. We have power over the devil. Now what have they done? They've built up their faith by speaking it. They go back to that demon and say, Now listen, I don't care who you think we are. We are not here in our own authority. We are here because Jesus gave us power. Now in the name of Jesus, you get out of that little boy. Bam! That thing would have listened right there. The Bible says in, in James that when you submit to God and resist the devil, he flees from you. And that's what would have happened here. And that's exactly what Jesus was trying to get them to do. So if we remove this doubt and unbelief that has tried to stop us. See, doubt and unbelief are the things that usually hinder what we're trying to step into. 
It was a time that Jesus went back to his own hometown and uh, he, he was preaching the word and they got offended. They said, who is this carpenter's son? We know his mother, his brothers and his sisters are here with us. Where does he get this wisdom? And they were offended because of it. And the Bible says Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, doubt will stop the miracles of God from happening in our lives. Now let me show us how to deal with that. Come with me to Romans chapter 4. This is a great example that we get from uh, Abraham, the father of our faith. And we see here how doubt and unbelief was dealt with, how he dealt with it. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So God already declared that Abraham was a father of many nations. Even before Isaac was ever born, God called him a father of many nations. And the Bible says here, in the presence of him who, whom he believed. Now that word, in the presence of whom he believed, in the original Greek literally means that he imitated God, just like God. In, because God said it, he did the same thing. And that is God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now there's a very important part of faith. You know, a lot of people turn that around and they call things that are as if though they are not. And that's not what it's saying here. You know, for someone to say, I'm not in debt, I'm not in debt, I'm not in debt, I'm not in debt. That's not faith. If you're in debt, you're in debt. Now that's a fact, you know, we don't deny the facts. We don't say, I'm not sick when you're sneezing and splashing all over the place. That's not faith. That is not faith in operation. Faith doesn't deny the facts. But what faith does, it believes the higher law. So even though my body may be sick and hurting, I believe a higher law that says, by Jesus' stripes I have been healed. And so I call the thing that is not as if though it is. Not the thing that is as if though it's not. Are you getting the difference? I know it's... You know, it it's, it's, may sound pedantic, but the difference is important. So I don't call the thing that already exists and ignore and say it's not there. You know, someone came to me and said, Pastor Alan, I, the devil's attacking me. I'm in so much debt and he keeps attacking me. I don't know how to get out of debt. He keeps attacking me. The devil put me in debt. No, 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 the devil didn't put you in debt. You go back to those credit card slips and you'll see they got all your signatures on it. So, you know, we can't keep blaming the devil for it. So the fact that I got into debt, if I deny it, I'll keep staying in debt and keep causing the problem over and over, but I keep spending. So how do I get out of it? You see, there are people out there that are living on the street right now, hobos and, you know, street people, that are completely out of debt, and yet they're on the street. So what must I do? I find a higher law. Philippians 4.19 says that my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now that'll get the debt paid, off the account settled, and provision for everything that I need. And so, by doing that, instead of calling the debt as not there, I admit, yes, the debt is there, but you know what? My God supplies needs. And I believe that now as a result of God supplying my needs, I declare that I am getting out of debt. In the name of Jesus, I am debt free, I am provided for, God supplies my every need, and in the name of Jesus, I have, every need, I have every need supply. In the name of Jesus, by Jesus' stripes, I have been healed. I believe I'm healed. Now, I'm doing what the Word says. Let the weak say, I am strong. Notice it doesn't say, let the weak say, I'm not weak. It says, let the weak say, I am strong. So now what you're doing is you are establishing the truth of God's Word. That's what he said, yeah. He calls things which do not exist as though they did. Now listen to this. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised, God was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, get a hold of what it says here in verse 20. It says that he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. The Living Bible says he did not doubt. With never doubting, 
he believed the Word of God. So now how come he never doubted? Why do you think Abraham was this great big, I mean, you know, everybody that I've ever spoken to about faith uh, have told me that there are times that we experience doubt. You know, myself, if, think, if I think about it, there are times that I'm standing on God's Word, thoughts of doubt come along. You know, you suddenly wonder, I wonder what will happen if that doesn't work. Those are thoughts of doubt. Yet we see here that Romans tells us Abraham never doubted. <laughs> Hang on now. Every human being I know has doubted from some time or another. So how come this Abraham never doubted? I mean, you know, is he some superhero faith man? No, no, no. We must understand what the Bible's talking about here. That doubt that he's speaking about here is the heart. Remember, uh, Jesus said, look at, look at this very quickly before we close for today. Mark chapter 11. We'll pick this up here tomorrow. Mark chapter 11. Look what it says here in verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. See, the devil has no right or access to your heart unless you open the door and give it to him through continuously sinning, knowingly sinning, and, and not doing anything about it. And of course that gives access to Satan. But if you've given your heart to Jesus, he has no access to your heart. Now your heart is your spirit man. He cannot attack your heart. Do you know where He does attack us? In our minds. He tries to bring thoughts and seeds of doubt into your mind. And that's what He'll try and do here. Try and put these doubts of seeds into your mind. And Jesus says, don't take it into your heart. Now, how does that work? How do I, make, how do I differentiate between doubt in the thoughts and doubt in the heart? Now, we are the town for today, but I'm going to show you that tomorrow. Alan Bagg Ministries is coming to your area. This weekend, Dr. Alan Bagg will be ministering at Christian Family Church, Johannesburg, the ministry of Dr. Theo and Beverly Volmars. For information regarding this engagement, please contact us at these details. Faith being a free gift from God is useless if you don't know how to activate and use it. In this powerful series, Pastor Alan Bagg probes the Word of God by using Scripture to reveal steps you can use to activate your faith. The law of faith. That tells me faith operates by laws. In the same way you had to turn on the television to watch this program, there are also things you need to do that will launch you into living a life of faith. The just shall live by faith. In over four hours of teaching, Pastor Alan Bagg will help you to live a life that is pleasing to God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Get this series today. Contact us at these details. Discover faith. Discover the key to kingdom living. Put these tapes on, play them over and over and over till you can almost quote them off by heart. What will happen is the hearing of this word builds and strengthens your inner man and you become a Christian with a heart full of faith and you will know how to apply that faith and you will see the results that faith brings. So make sure you get that today. How to make your faith work. Now my dear friend, as you watch this program, if you've never yet given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that today. He loves you. He paid the price that you could have eternal life and today is the day of your salvation. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer now and I won't you know, this is not about joining a church or doing anything religious. Just the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and you confess with your mouth that He's your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, say it with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. I believe Jesus, you died for me. You paid the price for all my sin. And today, I know you are raised from the dead. You are alive. And I invite you to come into my heart. I make you Lord of my life. And I know as I do this, I am now born again a child of God. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You are born again. I have something to give to you. This is a card that's going to explain to you what you've just done as well as some instruction now that you are a Christian, how to live life. And then also the study program is going to help you study through the Bible. And then also 
my Christian passport out of this world of failure into His kingdom of victory. That's our free gift to you. And all you need to do is call us on that phone number or write to me at that address. And when I get your details, I'm going to send that to you free of charge. We'll also pay the postage and you'll have that in a few days' time. Well, thank you once again to everybody who's been writing to us. I appreciate the letters. We receive them and I read every one of them. And we make sure that there is a prayer team that prays over every single request. I pray for you every day and I look forward to hearing your great testimonies about what faith has done in your life. And until we meet sometime later in personally, I'll see you again here tomorrow on this program. This is Pastor Alan Bagg once again reminding you Jesus is Lord. And remember, life is a choice. You know how now. Choose life. God bless. To order this week's programs, contact us at this number or these addresses. 